Welcome to Health Matters. I'm Ewan Ashley, a professor of cardiology and genetics at Stanford. And I'd like to tell you over the next few minutes some stories from the work that we've done here at Stanford over the last 10 years relating to the human genome. These stories are to be found in my recent book, The Genome Odyssey, Medical Mysteries, and the Incredible Quest to Solve Them. The first question, though, is who is this guy and where did he come from? And much more importantly, what is he wearing in this photo? This is the Scottish national dress that you might recognize. This is the Fraser tartan, and this is my kilt and sparren. I don't wear this very much in California. Back in Scotland, however, we wear it quite a lot. This is a picture of my homeland. I didn't actually grow up in the Laphroaig Distillery on the west coast of Scotland on the island of Isla. I grew up in Glasgow, a major city in the mainland of Scotland. But this is a place we visited and a place that makes very nice single malt scotch that you might like to try if you haven't. This is what counts for a swimming pool uh, that we would jump in in the summer in Scotland. This is me and my dad from many years ago. This is me shivering, doing some fishing back in Scotland around uh, seven years old. And I realized from a pretty early age that I was a bit of a nerd. I loved the Rubik's Cube. I loved to program computers. I wrote a tax program for my dad's medical practice when I was 12 years old and realized that the future was in data. I always wanted to be a doctor, though. This is a picture of my father, who was a local GP, and my mother, who was a midwife. And they used to take me out on their house calls. And so I learned from a very, very early age that medicine was about much more than a job, more than even really a profession. It was really a way of life. I trained in medicine at Glasgow in Scotland and moved to Oxford to do a PhD in molecular genetics and then took a giant leap across the ocean from the UK to Stanford, California in 2002, where I came for, as I thought at the time, two years. 20 years later, I'm still here and I'm incredibly grateful uh, to Stanford campus and to Silicon Valley in general for providing me incredible opportunities. In particular, I've had the opportunity to spend time with leaders of the governments of the United States and the UK and many other places around the world, some of the leaders of Silicon Valley and other technology companies. And I've started a family here, uh, which I'm very happy to say is there are three young kids who are, who are now healthy and living their own lives here uh, in California. This is me in my work clothes. I'm a, an attending cardiologist at Stanford Hospital where I see patients with heart attacks and heart failure and trans heart transplants. But in my lab, that's where we spent time thinking really hard about the human genome. The human genome is a secret code that is inside almost every single cell in your body. It's a code that's unique to you. It connects you to every other living organism on Earth. It connects you to the entire history of the human race. It's six billion base pairs, six billion data points. Each one of them is an A, a T, a G, or a C. And if I was to take out the genome from every single cell in your body and stretch it end to end, it would reach to the moon and back thousands of times. In fact, if you were to stare at this screen continuously for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it would take you three months before you saw every single base pair in your human genome. So not surprisingly, to sequence the genome of just one person, the Human Genome Project, took 10 years, 10 countries, and multiple billions of dollars between 1990 and 2000, when this New York Times article declared that the genetic code of human life was cracked by scientists, the draft sequence of the human genome was released to the world, a huge amount of blood, sweat, and tears was expended. The next genome was that of the person you also saw on that page, Craig Venter, next to Francis Collins. And his genome cost $100 million. And over the course of the next 10 years, the cost of genome sequencing dropped at such a fast rate, it was compared to Moore's law. Gordon Moore was the co-founder of Intel, the semiconductor company and, and whose uh, products really pushed the technology of Silicon Valley forward. In fact, the technology of the transistors on an integrated circuit were moving forward so fast that it doubled every 18 months. And this became emblematic of the idea of technology advancement. But as you can see from the graph, in 2008, the cost of genome sequencing left Moore's law in the dirt. You can now sequence a human genome for $500. And that's just an unprecedented change, an unprecedented move forward of technology over the course of just 10 years. I often show this graph, but I find that people remember much more clearly when I put it in Ferrari terms. Now, your average Stanford faculty member like me isn't able to afford a Ferrari like this. I used to drive past this one on the way home from Stanford from my lab. It comes in at around $400,000. But if this Ferrari had dropped in cost as much as human genome sequencing had dropped in cost, that Ferrari could be yours for one cent. One cent. 
10 years later, and this technology is available for everyone. And that story of how we got from one genome to millions of genomes is one I'd like to tell you just a little bit about over the course of the next few minutes. The first genome I looked at was that of a friend and colleague, Steve Quick, shown here on the screen. He's the chair of bioengineering at Stanford, and I wandered into his office in late 2009, and I, I was there to talk to him about a genetics seminar. But we never really quite got to that, because when I found his office in the curiously labeled buildings of the Clark Building here on Stanford campus, I found him huddled at his computer pecking at the keys, and on screen were a whole series of A's, T's, C's, G's. Basically, his human genome was on the screen. And I realized in front of me was one of the only people in the world at the time, in fact, one of only five people in the world to ever have his genome sequenced. He had made headlines around the world that summer when with two people in his lab and over the course of one week for a cost of $50,000, he had sequenced his entire genome. Now I've told you a genome costs $500, you think $50,000 is expensive, but the one just before Steve's cost $200,000. So this was a major advance. But it wasn't so much the ability to sequence the genome as what was in it that really counted. And as he started to show me variants he had in genes that I knew well because of my work as a cardiologist at Stanford Hospital, I recognized that he had variants in genes that could potentially cause heart disease. And I started asking him about his family history of heart disease. It's shown here. Anywhere you see orange on this family pedigree is someone in Steve's family who has suffered a form of heart disease. In particular, he showed me variants in genes that can be associated with diseases that can cause sudden death. And I asked him if anyone in his family had ever died suddenly. And his cousin's son, shown on the bottom left of the screen here, died age 19, having never had a sick day in his life. And at that moment, it became clear that Steve wasn't just about to be a colleague that I had at Stanford, but he was about to be my patient. And as I invited him to clinic that day, I realized he was about to be the first patient anywhere in the world to walk into a clinic with his genome on a hard drive. And much more scarily, that clinic was mine. <laughs> we were in a situation in medicine where we, we were used to looking at studies where there were five numbers, a cholesterol panel. Suddenly, we had a genetic test, a molecular test, a medical test, that had six billion numbers in it. How were we gonna make sense of that, especially in a 12 minute doctor's appointment? So we set out over the course of the next year to build tools that would allow us to understand the genome in the context of medicine for the first time. We built tools like the one you see on the left, a scorecard for a number of different diseases where our tool can read across your whole genome and push the needle in one direction or the other, increasing or reducing your probability of suffering these diseases. We integrated your genes with your environment it's very important to be able to say what risks do you carry in your genome that when exposed to the right environment would actually manifest as disease. And we published our paper at the time and we're very happy with, with the work we did, but I don't think we were really ready quite for the reaction it received. And over the course of several weeks around the time when the paper came out, we were deluged with interest. Something about the human genome, something about daring, staring deeply into somebody's human genetic makeup struck a chord with people. And the idea that people were really ready for an individualized or personalized form of medicine. And we spent time talking to reporters in many different countries in many different times. Over the course of the next few years, we were lucky enough to spend time working with the Obama administration and, and others, helping advise on genomic medicine, or as we more commonly refer to it now as precision medicine. Well, shortly after that, we, I, I, I received a phone call from a father, father of uh, two, shown here actually, John West. And he started asking me about a pulmonary embolism that he'd suffered. This is a clot that usually starts in the legs, that travels up to the heart and then into the lungs and it embeds, causing pain and shortness of breath. And as he started to describe this to me, I thought it sounded very much like he had a clotting problem. And so maybe he should talk to a hematologist. But before I got to that, he mentioned that he had sequenced the genome of his entire family. And he'd seen the work we did with Steve Quake and he was wondering if we could help him work out what was happening in his family's genomes, in particular in his genome, to predispose him to a pulmonary embolism. Well, that took us to an unusual place. And I don't know if any of you in the audience are from Buffalo in New York or are listening to this talk from Buffalo in New York, but the only thing I knew about Buffalo in New York before this study was that's where chicken wings came from. And actually, the story of where chicken wings came from is pretty interesting. And if you're interested, you will find it in, in the book, The Genome Odyssey. I won't tell you it today. But another thing that happened, and another thing that came from Buffalo in New York, was the human genome reference sequence. That first genome that I mentioned at $3 billion came actually from 10 people 
who had their blood drawn in Buffalo and New York. And that blood was then made into DNA and essentially put in a pool and sequenced as part of the Human Genome Project. Because they were real people, though, it turned out one of them actually had a genetic variant that predisposed to clotting, which we found when we went to look in John West's genome for the cause of the clotting that caused his pulmonary embolism. And it led us to build a whole new series of tools, just like this one shown here, that help us understand the genome in the context of a family. We share so many things with our family members, the environment we live up, we grow up in, towels, toothbrushes. We also share DNA. And this tool allowed us for the first time to manage to map pieces of DNA from each individual within this nuclear family, two parents and, and two kids, so that we could understand which genetic variants came from mom, came from dad, or were brand new in the individual kids to help explain their risk for numbers of different diseases. So we started moving genetics into a world where it was the family that mattered. We also, this being Stanford, started a company to help us deal with all the incoming requests we had now for examining the genomes of individuals to understand their medical risks. And so I'd like to tell you over the next few minutes a couple of stories from two patients that are very dear to our hearts, where we used the human genome to illuminate the, their medical future. The first one was a little baby who first came to our attention when she was 36 weeks. That's 36 weeks of gestation. She was still swimming around inside her mom. And she was found to have a heart rate of 70 beats per minute, which is OK if you're an adult sitting in a chair. But if you're a little girl swimming around in your mother's womb, your heart rate should be more like 140 beats per minute. So we brought mom and baby to Stanford, where the baby was delivered by a cesarean section. And we found the reason for the low heart rate was actually a genetic condition called long QT syndrome. QT is the region of the heartbeat where the heart resets, ready for the next one. And this explained why our heart rate was so low. But the low heart rate wasn't so much the problem as the fact that she was predisposed to potentially fatal cardiac rhythms. And on the first day of her little life, she suffered five cardiac arrests. And five times, the team at the bedside performed CPR to bring her back to life. We knew early on that this was a very severe presentation and that we had to do everything we could to save her life. She became the youngest baby in history to have a defibrillator placed in her abdomen. This is a, a device that can deliver a shock to bring the heart back to normal rhythm. But we also knew with this genetic condition, if we could understand the underlying molecular biology, the actual gene involved, we could give her a therapy that was tailored to that exact underlying condition and give her the best chance of survival. At the time, genome sequencing was just present, but it often would take months and months in large teams. If we even did clinical sequencing through the regular lab, it would take three months, it would sequence five genes, and it would cost $5,000. This little one didn't have that kind of time. So we pulled Every thread we could, we spoke to every collaborator we could, and over the course of a weekend, working with the Lumina, the sequencing company in San Diego, we managed to sequence her genome over the course of two days. While those two days uh, were going past, a postdoctoral scholar in my lab, James Priest, worked on our computer methods to speed them up so that we could get an answer even quicker. And in the course of just another day, we managed to work out that this was a particular form of long QT syndrome caused by a potassium channel. This allowed us to let the bedside team know immediately the right treatment to give at the right time and the right treatments that they could pull back on for her ultimate survival. We were really happy to see her six months later at a little park just outside her home. And I recently had the chance to see a picture of her from her fifth birthday party. She's doing incredibly well, really without any idea for the most part of the technology that was applied to the first few hours and days of her life. Well, in her case, we understood what condition she had. We did an electrocardiogram, and we realized what condition she was suffering from. Many patients go from doctor to doctor to doctor, accumulating mountains of paperwork, mountains of both emotional and financial burden, without ever having a diagnosis. This is often called a medical odyssey, after the classic Greek poem from Homer called The Odyssey. You'll notice it says on the front cover, this was voted one of the best books of 1995 including, actually, if you look on Amazon, you can see you can even follow the author, Homer, who probably isn't doing any more writing. These medical odysseys, though, are what we attack in a particular consortium of, of people called the Undiagnosed Diseases Network. And this is a group of doctors across the country and even with roots internationally, where we take on the hardest cases in medicine. And the, the armamentarium that we have 
Well, first of all, we use a Sherlock Holmes type approach to try to bring the smartest people into the room, to try to touch everyone we know to try to find an answer. But when that fails, and it's only successful about 10% of the time, we have to bring in the big guns. And in this case, the big guns are the genome. And that's what we did for these two boys. This is Carson and Chase Miller. Carson was the older of the two brothers, and he was born and hit all his milestones around the time of the first year. But as he just became one year old, he started to step back a little bit. And whereas he'd previously been cruising, almost walking and feeding himself, he was no longer able to do that. When his brother Chase came along and also didn't manage to hit the same motor milestones, we realized this, the, his dad, Danny, realized this must be a genetic condition. And he, with his mom, Nikki, started taking the boys to doctor after doctor after doctor. They went from specialist to subspecialist to super specialist to multiple neurologists, and nobody had an answer. They even had a particularly fancy genetic sequencing where you sequence all the genes in the genome, called an exome, and that still didn't find the answer. At that point, they were referred to the Undiagnosed Diseases Network, this group of doctors I mentioned. And we saw them at Stanford. And the first thing we did was sequence the genomes of all four individuals, mom, dad, and the two brothers. And the power of having the family's genomes together, like I just mentioned for the West family a few minutes ago, we were able to bring that to bear to make a diagnosis and to be able to work out that Carson and Chase were the eighth and ninth boys in the world ever to be diagnosed with a syndrome called Mepan syndrome. Now, I won't be asking difficult questions about this biochemical pathway at the end of the talk. The details don't matter so much. But the Mecker gene that you can see at the bottom right was disrupted in both boys, and it explained their inability to meet their motor milestones while remaining cognitively intact. This was a characteristic seen across all the boys who presented with Mepan syndrome. Now, if you imagine this biochemical pathway is like a little, little factory inside each of the cells, then the, the particular item is taken by one factory worker. They apply their particular, uh, if, if it's, let's say it's a, a factory of, of dolls, they'll, they'll apply their, perhaps the top or the, or the bottoms, and they'll pass it on to the next one in line. But if you take one factory worker out of the line, then of course there's a buildup of those dolls. There's nothing that happens downstream. What you really need is a genetic therapy to replace that factory worker, a way of just putting someone who knows exactly what to do and when right in at the right spot at the right time. That holy grail of genetic therapy is not yet with us, but it is the future. But right now, if you were able to replace some of the elements downstream, let's say fully clothed dolls further down the factory floor, and in this case, that would be something called lipoic acid, then you might be able to help significantly. And right now, if you're thinking lipoic acid might be some incredibly expensive therapy that would bankrupt our healthcare system, you'd be wrong. Because just a few clicks away, when Danny was spending hours into the middle of the night trying to work out what was up with his two boys, he was able, after we had the diagnosis, to find lipoic acid on the internet from Amazon for $16 a bottle. Literally the answer, part of the answer to his boy's significant, devastating neurological disease was to be found just a few clicks away. That's the power that a diagnosis can bring to these families, the power of understanding the starting point and on the route towards a cure. And here's a picture of Danny with, the two, with his two boys. They were uh, kind enough to appear on CBS this morning when we released the first results from our study from the Undiagnosed Diseases Network. We released data on the first 1,200 cases. We solved 132, about 35%, and defined 31 new syndromes, all through the power of the genome. In a year when there was a lot of other bad news, we were delighted to be featured as This Week in Good News in the New York Times. Well, rare disease is where the genome has been. Where is it going to go going forward? What about the diseases that many of us who are a little older than those kids that I told you about there are suffering? What about heart attacks and strokes and cancer? Well, the genome can be very effective there as well. In fact, we're moving to the, in our use of the genome from a reactive approach where we try to diagnose after the fact to one where we move forward to be proactive in preventing disease. And nowhere is that more important than preventing heart attack. If you go to your general practitioner and talk about your risk for heart attack, he or she will ask you about smoking or diabetes or cholesterol, and he or she will then put those answers into a calculator to tell you what your risk will be and help you decide whether to take aspirin or a statin medication or do other preventive health measures like diet and exercise, which everyone should do, by the way. 
But if, if you were to add the nature component to the nurture that you were just asked about, you would have significantly improved ability to predict that risk. As shown here, the predictive power of a genetic risk score exceeds the predictive power of all those questions you were just asked. But of course, the answer is to put the two together. And I'm very happy to say that at Stanford this year, we're launching a pilot of preventive genomics where we use sequencing of the genome to be able to provide both the nature and the nurture component to predict risk of heart attack and cancer so that the power of the genome can come to everyone. Well, in the last few minutes, I want to tell you about another genome. And here it is on the screen. In fact, this is the entire genome. It doesn't take you three months of watching a screen to see it all. This is, in fact, the protein sequence for the particular genome in question that is 30,000 letters, much smaller than the 6 billion in your human genome. But don't let its size fool you, because this genome brought the world to its knees. This is the genome of the SARS-CoV-2, the novel coronavirus responsible for the pandemic. And when it was sequenced and the Chinese Health Authority released that sequence on January the 10th in 2020, within hours we were able to build tests across the world for infection with this, this disease. The power of the genome was such that we had those molecular tests ready almost immediately. We were able to do that at an individual level, and many of you may have had a rather uncomfortable nasal swab or a saliva-based test for SARS-CoV-2. Also, what we're able to do is have an early warning system. Here, we can pick up the SARS-CoV-2 genome from the wastewater in San Jose, predicting seven days in advance if there was going to be a spike and allowing us to prepare the appropriate ICU beds and, and healthcare um, resources. If we'd moved a bit faster, perhaps we could have moved technologies like this that we're now supporting at Stanford forward quicker. We will be ready for the next pandemic with tests that are $1.30 minute saliva tests that you can do at home. If this technology invented by Manu Prakash from Stanford was available in the early days of the pandemic, we would not have needed lockdowns. We have the technology and it's genome-based technology the genome tells us other things. It tells us about the variants in the virus so that we can track the virus in real time through the world and make sure our treatments are focused on the right variants. It also reveals health disparities. And in particular, in this work that we published here from Stanford patients, where we sequenced both the virus and the human who was infected, we realized that those underrepresented in society were those who were overrepresented in those coming forward infected with SARS-CoV-2. The genome can shine a light on those disparities and help us make healthcare more even, make sure we're looking after everyone in society. But the biggest effect of understanding the genome of the novel coronavirus was the ability to develop in days, albeit building on decades of scientific work, but to build in days genomic vaccines. Each of the major vaccines that is now in use around the world and that is showing us the exit door to the pandemic was developed as a result of that sequencing of SARS-CoV-2, in many cases through academic and industry collaboration. And this was genomic vaccine development at earth-shattering speed. This used to take five years. This was done in nine or 10 months to take us from a point where we had no exit to the point where we can clearly see where we need to go. To prevent the next big one, we need a global biosurveillance force. We need to get ahead. We can guess what the next cause of a likely pandemic would be. We can get ahead of it, sequence it, even build vaccines for it in advance so that we're ready if one hits. Genomics has brought us to the point where we can apply to infectious disease the sorts of revelations I've been able to share with you that we've applied in rare disease and the preventive genomics we're looking forward to do over the next few years for common diseases like heart attack. It's been my pleasure spending a few moments with you. If you've enjoyed hearing these stories, I encourage you to uh, get a hold of the book, The Genome Odyssey, and learn about more medical mysteries and the incredible quest to solve them. Thanks so much for joining me today. Hello and welcome to the question and answer session for Dr. Ewan Ashley. I'm Kathy Hutton, a member of the Health Matters team here at Stanford Medicine, and I'm here with Dr. Ashley. Thank you so much for your presentation, Dr. Ashley. I'd like to ask our viewers if you have any questions that you'd like to ask Dr. Ashley at this point, please.
please do place your questions into the Q&A box found in your Zoom toolbar, and we'll get to as many of them as we can in the next 25 minutes here together. And there are plenty of questions coming in, so let's definitely get started and we'll do our very best to get to each one of those in the time that we have allotted. Dr. Ashley, if, genes, if genome sequencing has become so affordable, uh, when will it be a little bit more widely offered and more uh, generally used inside primary care? Well, great question, uh, Kathy. And first of all, thanks so much for, for joining us here. And, and it's just a pleasure to be part of the Health Matters event. And thank you to everyone in the audience for, for jumping in. Um, yeah, genome sequencing, I hope you had a sense from the talk of, of just how excited I am personally about the impact we can make on patients with this technology. I also think we're at a really interesting point because when we started being able to sequence genomes for medicine, that was about 10 years ago, as you, as you heard in the talk, we were mostly applying that to rare disease. Now, rare disease is collectively rather common. You know, actually one in 10, one in 15 people suffers from a rare disease. So that's an important sector of the population. Uh, and collectively, a large number of people have a rare disease. But what we're looking for in the next 10 years is to be able to make the genome relevant for the other nine out of 10 people who perhaps don't have a rare disease, but have a common disease. And we're talking here like conditions like high blood pressure, coronary artery disease, like heart attacks, uh, diabetes, these, these kind of conditions. And I'm, I'm excited to say that, that we are moving now towards using uh, the genome for those much more common conditions and even doing more than just diagnosing disease, but rather helping prevent disease. And in fact, over the course of the next six months, I mentioned this in the talk at Stanford, we're actually for the first time moving genomics into primary care and preventive care, which is to say that, let's say, for the if you go talk to your doctor at Stanford over the course of the next uh, six months, probably starting in the fall, and you want to talk about risk for heart attack and what you could maybe do about your risk for heart attack, then you will have the opportunity to, to be one of the first people in the world to get a test that incorporates genome information from across your whole genome with the regular information that we use every day, like cholesterol and whether you have diabetes and high blood pressure um, and, and integrate that into uh, to give you a sense of your risk of, of heart attack. So we're for the first time using the nature and nurture part of this to come together and I think that's that's what will break the dam, if you like, and, and allow the genomic data to be used really for everybody's healthcare in the developing and the developed world, since heart attack is the most common cause of death across the entire world. Dr. Ashley, when you actually take a look at genomic data, another question that a guest has is regarding how many generations of a family history do you actually look at when you're looking at familial genetic data? Yeah, well, that, so we have these amazing genetic counselors who are part of, of our clinics, and we're very lucky at Stanford. We have one of the largest groups in cardiology of, of genetic counselors actually anywhere who are focused on inherited heart disease. Of course, we have them also in various other uh, parts of, of Stanford medicine, uh, but they do the heavy lifting. They do the hard work of digging uh, and doing the detective work around family history. And it's really a, a fascinating process. I mean, often your, do your doctor might only have a few minutes to quickly ask about other members of the family who might have had heart attacks or cancer or Alzheimer's disease. But genetic counselors are a specialist. I mean, they go un undergo go years of training in order to, to essentially delve in deeply and describe in detail, really put uh, in, in a detailed portrait of, of many generations. We tend to, to think of four as a, a pretty standard uh, four generation family history. So that's our, our, our standard. But at times we go back further. Uh, usually we're limited by people's memory and uh, also how they, how, what they just know about their own family and the details they're able to gather. But sometimes it involves going and looking at de death records, death certificates, uh, sometimes uh, records from long in the past. Sometimes we even get tissue samples from decades ago and start analyzing those. So it's a really in-depth kind of detective work that these genetic counselors do uh, across a, you know, at least a minimum of three and usually around four generations. Dr. Ashley, another question came in from our guests. They were asking that when you and the genetic counselors are actually looking at this data, is there an average number of genetic variants that most families have or experience? Mm. Well, so uh, you, we heard some of the numbers, uh, genome numbers during the talk. So we, the genome is basically 6 billion letters, first of all. So you have two copies of each gene. You get a copy 
uh, from your, your mom and a copy from your dad. So sort of three billion base pairs is how we often think of the size of the genome. What we do once we sequence the genome is then compare it to, it's not an average, it's, it's, but it is a reference sequence. It's, it's, there's a story actually in, in, in the book that I was, I was talking about, about where that reference sequence came from. And it came from Buffalo in New York, as you all now know. Um, so when we compare to that reference, then we end up with a much smaller file because most of us share uh, the genome with other humans. Like our genome is mostly like other humans. We even share large amounts of our genome with bananas and other other living organisms. Um, but of course we share a lot with other humans. So, so that then takes us from 6 billion down to actually about 3 million. So there are usually about 3 million places where a single letter change is different from our reference sequence. Um, we also look at big changes in the genome that are not just single letter changes, but a big chunk of the genome is either deleted or inserted. And we usually find a few thousand of those as well. So. And then when we start to look at what are shared among individuals that in two siblings, for example, who share on average 50% of their genome, though that number can be anything from their high 30s, like 40% to you know, even high 50s. So it's not, you don't share exactly 50% with your siblings, but it's about that number. So if you take you know, about 3 million and say that you share about half of that with your siblings, then you're talking about one and a half million, just as one way of, of thinking about the answer to that question. Wow, thank you for that. And as this information and the data that you're looking at and the genetic counselors are looking at moves more into primary care and, and clinical care, uh, a guest is asking what the prospect is of insurance companies starting to su actually support genetic testing. This particular audience member's experience has been that insurance companies have traditionally rejected genetic testing as for study purposes and not necessary for treatment. And what are your thoughts on that matter? Yeah, that has to change. I mean, uh, and we are constantly in communication with the insurance companies and the payers. They move slowly. And uh, obviously they're mainly interested in reducing costs and maintaining uh, care and also maintaining profit and value for their shareholders. And, uh, you know, we, we, we have the system that we have in this country and many people are working hard on, on improving it. I think the value proposition provided by genetic testing, though, is is undisputed at this point. There are there are there is nobody who thinks that, uh, that the sorts of tests we've been talking about in the sorts of settings that we have been talking about them here, uh, there's really no question anymore in the minds of the experts. Um, for example, and and I think I, I, I not, can't remember actually if I mentioned this in the talk now, but we looked we did some cost analysis of how much money would be saved if we deploy genome sequencing earlier in the diagnostic odyssey within the undiagnosed diseases program. And the answer was 95%. I mean, the costs were 95% lower if we deployed this test earlier. And that's because people with undiagnosed disease, they go from doctor to doctor, they get repeat tests at one doctor, repeat tests at another doctor, they accumulate all this baggage, financial and emotional baggage that goes along with having an undiagnosed disease. And it's a lot of do dollars for the healthcare system. Ultimately, if you can find the answer in a third to a half of the cases by deploying a test that now costs less than $1,000, well, then you, you save a lot, of, a lot of money. And so many cases, these genetic tests are cost saving. So they're not just cost effective, but they actually save the healthcare system. And so we have had those conversations. You know, there are definitely executives at many of the, the reimbursement payers who are convinced by this, but it's like a big tanker, you know, it takes a while to turn around. And so we're definitely seeing movement. They're starting to ask us for direct communication a, a bit less and start to actually approve automatically a bit more, uh, but it's taking longer than, than I would like. And I'm really, um, really understand what, what our patients and families go through when they're, they're waiting and they feel like they get potential access to the best care, they get potentially access to the best testing, and then somebody in an office somewhere who, who, without the name and without a face tells them that they can't have it unless they pay out their own mm. pocket. So that, you know, that, that's something we're really working hard at, uh, but it's not entirely, unfortunately, in our, in our domain to, to fix, but we're working hard. As this uh, genetic and genomic testing uh, and assessment continues, can you speak to how CRISPR technology will be folded into the genomic approaches for treatment and cure of the diseases? Yeah, very exciting, of course. Uh, CRISPR or gene editing, the ability to change one base pair to another or even multiple base pairs to the, the wild type or sort of normal 
in order to cure genetic diseases. Uh, that's a, just an incredibly exciting area. Um, and it's coming. I mean, it, it's, it's not, I wouldn't say it's quite prime time yet, uh, for sure. But genetic therapy overall is, is in a golden era. We are, we are beginning to provide real cures, really. And that, I use that word very cautiously normally, but, but it really what could only be described as cures for genetic conditions. And that is using technology that hasn't yet truly incorporated CRISPR and gene editing. I think we're, we're really at the beginning of the wave of when companies and, and pharmaceutical companies are able to really use CRISPR gene editing in order to have the, the major impact. We're, we're, we're looking at heart diseases, in particular in my laboratory at Stanford, and we're looking at using a particular form of, of gene editing called base editing, where you specifically go in instead of uh, cutting the genome and repairing it, which is what happens with CRISPR. Uh, we can go use some of the CRISPR technology to get to the right spot in the genome, and then instead of having to cut it, we can just change one of the bases to the, you know, from the wrong letter to the right letter. Uh, and that's just an incredible technology for us to have. And I think it really brings the possibility of cure really to within um, the range for, for many genetic diseases. Now, that's not the only thing we need to be able to do. Of course, we need to be able to get that CRISPR technology or that base editor into the right tissue at the right time. And that's a challenge that we've made a bit less progress on. We're definitely working on it. And actually right now, many, of course, we're in the middle of the, the pandemic and many of us have, have had vaccinations i'm happy to say at this point and that vaccination is a form of genetic technology those are uh, programmable vaccines and so and, and for some of the the vaccines like the jnj and the one from astrazeneca they actually they actually use a, a, a special like virus that doesn't multiply in order to deliver uh, the therapy deliver the vaccine and that's the way that we're looking at delivering many of these crispr uh, gene editing tools is to be able to get uh, a kind of virus that doesn't multiply as a, as a vehicle. We think of it as a, like the vehicle that can drive up to the door of the right cell at the right time, kind of put the, the baggage out uh, on the sidewalk that needs to then get in, in the door of the house, if you like, we continue the metaphor in order to do its job in the nucleus of the right cells that are affected by the disease in question. Well, thanks for that pivot also a little bit to the pandemic and COVID. There are a few questions mm -hmm. on that topic as well, if I could share those with mm -hmm. you. A guest asks yeah. uh, that you had mentioned that genome sequencing helps track COVID variants. And the guest is curious whether it can also help predict them as well. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's obviously been, you know, a huge challenge for and continues to be, if we think globally, it continues to be a massive challenge. We're not out the other side, even although some countries like, like the US are beginning to, to really turn the corner in the pandemic, I'm happy to say. Genome sequencing, in this case, the genome being the genome of the virus, as I uh, discussed in the talk, uh, is, has been a major uh, contributor to our understanding of the pandemic from the beginning. And, and the driver, in fact, of all the technology that is saving us from the pandemic. So it was January, the, I think January the 19th or 20th of last year, that the Chinese health authority released that sequence that I showed uh, of uh, the SARS-CoV-2 and allowed us to identify what it was, the ancestry of that virus, and then to start to track it around the globe. It's one of the reasons, for example, that we understood where the virus first came to the United States and, and understood that some uh, individuals came to the East Coast from Europe and from the West Coast uh, from Asia directly. And, and so it gives us a real time map of, the, of a pandemic. Sequencing allows us to, to know where the virus is at. And then to the point, we can, that map can, can, can be richly illustrated with the actual individual variants. And we could talk a bit more about what they mean and some of the unfortunate miscommunication around variants that there has been. But just talking about sequencing for a bit, a bit longer, um, we then end up with this map of how the, the virus evolves. And, and unfortunately, if we have waves of the virus, it has this opportunity to evolve. That's what it, that's what it does. Um, and it's possible that it could evolve, in, in most cases, it'll evolve to something uh, less transmissible and less virulent or less severe. But of course, if it's doing that a lot, then one of these times it might evolve to something that's more transmissible uh, and could potentially cause more severe, though those two things don't necessarily go together. And we've seen variants that are more transmissible, but not any more severe. Um, we've seen and seen the opposite as well. The question though was about, could we use the sequencing to predict? And, and yes, is the answer. In fact, it ties to the last topic. Um, you can actually use CRISPR technology and, and related technologies to actually uh, mutate in the lab. Of course, you, you have to be really careful, but you can mutate viruses in the lab by changing the letters 
and then test in cells in a very confined and careful environment um, what what different mutations uh, do to the transmissibility and to the virulence or severity of disease of, of a virus. So we can absolutely use sequencing and genome engineering to understand what mutants of the virus are possible and how they might operate and in fact allow us to get potentially ahead of them. We're now moving to the point where we'll have boosters for, for at least targeted at one of the, the variants that, that was escaping just a little bit the, the vaccines. And so the genomic technology has, is really what has underlain our, our major response to this because all the testing is based on understanding the genome of the virus. All of the major vaccines are based on understanding the genome of the virus. So it could not be more fundamental to, to saving us and showing us the light at the end of the tunnel of the pandemic, this, this sequencing technology. In addition to understanding the biology of, of the virus, there's a question about the long-term impacts as well too, and how gen genome sequencing might be used to address or predict long haul COVID cases for patients like those related to chronic fatigue syndrome or other ongoing illnesses following uh, the COVID infection. Yeah, a really important point in that we're not just dealing with the potential immediate consequences um, of the disease, but also a large number of people who have some, some uh, sy symptoms over the long term, the so called long COVID symptoms. And that number seems relatively high, although it's also important to say that for most people, the symptoms are relatively mild and that they, they go away over time as, as best we can tell. Also, it's important to say that it's not surprising that this is the case. Uh, we are used to a fatigue syndrome that follows the flu, and we've been working through a flu, a, a flu season uh, every winter. Uh, the flu also doesn't go away in summer. It just appears to because the numbers get smaller. Um, so, so we're used to that. Also, uh, diseases like mononucleosis or mo known as, as mono, we're used to uh, not uncommonly uh, patients suffering from fatigue syndromes after, after infection with Epstein-Barr virus or cytomegalovirus that, are, that can cause those syndromes. So we were ready for it uh, and we are now studying it. Um, of course, it, it's concerning and, and yet another reason to be vaccinated and, uh, and protected. Um, can genome sequencing help? I think there's a two ways in which it might be able to help. First of all, who is predisposed? We've been doing a lot of work and I showed some of it in the talk with international groups where we pool all, all our information about individuals' genomes in order to help understand who's at risk of severe disease versus who's at risk of, uh, or who's more likely to have mild disease. So that would be the first thing. And we do the same thing for the so-called long uh, COVID, who see if we can find genetic markers that would predict who might be more likely to have that. And then uh, the, the second way is, is really to use genome sequencing in the way, again, that I, I talked about, where we are actually looking for viral reservoirs. We're looking for the maintenance of perhaps your immune response has completely eradicated the virus and you're kind of holding it somewhere and that's what's driving the long COVID. There's been some stories then of people getting vaccinated who've had long COVID and then getting better because their immune system is now ramped up and can, can finally uh, eradicate the virus from the body. So I think, although it's not really a, a, a standard thing, I think there's a potential that sequencing, viral sequencing could help in those kind of cases by, by picking out those individuals who still have uh, the, the virus even over long periods of time. And we know that folks who have an immunocompromise, like a lower than normal immune system for a variety of reasons, they can often harbor the virus much longer term uh, and have those kind of symptoms. Dr. Ashley, as you speak of the different ways that sequencing can be applied, one of the questions that's coming in from an audience member is, whether ethics should be considered as a genomics and the use of genomics becomes more mainstream in the ways that you're suggesting. Yeah, yeah, I mean, fundamental. And, and I think that uh, as, as I was telling the, the story a little bit of that first genome that we did, when we realized that we had a patient with a genome really for the first time, um, Actually, uh, I, I mean, I, I mentioned my calling up my friends to help, but one of the friends I called was Hank Greeley, who is world leading uh, medical ethicist. And, uh, and he helped us from the beginning think through it. We connected early on with also Kelly Ormond, who's one of our genetic counselors at Stanford. And really before we even set up the algorithms, the computer methods for understanding the genome, we set up the ethical framework for thinking about what we would do with that information. And that has been, uh, that framework has been in place now for, for 15, 
close to 15 years. And we have used that as we've talked about how to use genomes in medicine around the world and, and many aspects of it have been adopted starting from that moment. So, you know, I, I am absolutely correct. Yeah, we have a, a very important decisions and, and many of them continue to evolve the questions we need to consider. Many of them are the same and we're still wrestling with them and trying to, to uh, understand them. The fact that we're all connected, for example, especially as I mentioned already, siblings share lots of genomic information. So if you sequence your own genome, at some level, you're sequencing some part of your brother's genome and your sister's genome. Of course, you don't know which part. So, the, so that's a situation we never had before. The situations where if you sequence your whole genome, maybe you find things that you weren't expecting to find and that might have relevance for your son or your daughter. Um, and it's, there are situations where there might be a variant that's much less relevant for you, but could be very relevant for your daughter, for example, a breast cancer a gene variant. So there's all sorts of questions that we, we hadn't dealt with before. What about finding information where we can tell you that you have a risk of a disease, but we can't do anything about the disease? Should we deal with, with that kind of information differently? So these sorts of areas uh, we've been wrestling with since, you know, even before we could do genomes, we've been wrestling with it since when the first time we had genetic information on our patients, but they remain really important. And that collaboration with our ethics group, Mildred Cho and, and others at Stanford, has continued to be a very important and a, a vibrant part of, of what we're doing in genomics here at Stanford. And shifting back to a, a, a broader perspective, uh, thinking about the undiagnosed disease network, a question that's come in from my guest member is uh, whether that network is global and exactly how big is the network? Yeah, well, it's, it's growing which is the good news. Um, and it is uh, a global, I would say, certainly international for, for sure. Um, it's already grown within the US uh, in the sense that when we started, there were seven clinical centers. And well, let's say before we even set, set up the network, there was one clinical center doing this basically at the NIH and it was called the Undiagnosed Diseases Program. And it was really from that singular program that the network arose. And we originally had seven centers around the US. We now have 12 which is good. Um, and of course, what we're hoping to do is take the insights that we have learned from this network and, and really make the findings and the approaches much more broadly available. So we, what we really want is for, for there to be not a trickle down, but like a, a, a gush of a, of a, of a strong uh, river running downstream to, to clinics all across the country and, and internationally. But we also then aim to keep the Undiagnosed Diseases Network kind of at the cutting edge. And one of the things I, I really love about this program is that it combines two things. One very traditional thing, which is how do you solve medical mysteries? And that's, that's about Sherlock Holmes. It's about thinking deeply. It's about you know, assaying the scene and, and trying to understand clues, interpreting them, working closely in partnership with the family. Part of it is that very traditional approach to medicine. But also we get through the program to combine it with the absolute most cutting edge technology anywhere. And that's, that's what I, I love about this. And genome sequencing is just the start. We talk about sequencing immune cells now. We talk about using uh, technology to look at proteins and metabolites, and we use all of the tools at our disposal. So, um, so yes, we have grown within the US. Our aim is to make it much more available broadly within genetics clinics within the US, but there is also a UDN International, and I think uh, I don't quote me, but I think there might be 35 countries represented uh, at last count. There is a, a, a website, uh, both for the Stanford Undiagnosed Diseases Network that we will, I think, make available to you uh, and, an, and a website for the UDN International that is, is available where you can see around the world the different groups that are working on undiagnosed disease. As genome sequencing continues to grow in the medical community, both nationally and internationally, uh, what is your take or your perspective on direct consumer, consumer genomic testing in companies like 23andMe? There are guests who are asking about that as well. Yeah, well, I, I'm a fan, as, as everyone in the audience might have worked out, of, of data. Uh, I, I love data and I want to learn about me and my family. And uh, there are other people out there who clearly share that. Uh, not everyone does and they, they should be allowed to Keep their data to themselves and not not find out anything they don't want to but the direct and consumer companies have allowed people to learn genetic information about themselves and their families that i think is is very powerful 
Uh, and I think there's a reason that the largest single number of individuals who have genetic information in one place is not in a, a, a government or an academic study, but rather in, in these companies. I mean, there's upwards of 25 million people have their, their genetic data with uh, companies like 23andMe and Ancestry and others. And I think they find, of course, they find value in it. And mostly to date, of course, the value has been around learning about genealogy, learning about genetic ancestry with the, some other fun, fun facts that you learn from these companies too. There's obviously been a, a, a long and uh, sort of more winding path towards using that sort of information for health. And just to clarify, the sort of level of information you get from those companies is, is not the genome sequencing we were talking about in, in the talk, but rather a smaller amount of information, usually about a million spots on your genome is on the little array, little slide array that they, they look at when you spit in the tube and send it to these companies. So you can see the difference between 6 billion and a million gives you some sense that you're not getting the same level of information. It wouldn't be able to diagnose a rare disease, for example, it's not that sort of information. But it is very interesting uh, to look at ancestry. I think people have been surprised and interested and have spent a lot of time with that kind of data. And increasingly, we are starting to work out how to safely and uh, with a lot of validity incorporate that data into clinical care. Um, it's a similar level of data to the, what I was talking about at the beginning, where we're thinking of starting to incorporate genetic data more broadly into preventive care. Um, and so I'd also see these companies and we, you see them, you know, moving in that direction themselves. And personally, I think it's a good thing. I think it's really important, though, for people to understand that the, the level of data they're getting and, and, and exactly uh, where the data surrounding the validity of what they're learning is. So they can, uh, with, you know, have that data with and, and judge it with an open mind. But uh, yeah, I think some of it, I, I, I talked a little bit, actually, just thinking about it in the book about how you can also use that data to, to discover uh, medication, discover the next generation of drugs that are that are already known to kind of work in a sense in humans because we've already seen a genetic version of them uh, protect patients. We talk about sort of superhumans wandering around us uh, who have just a genetic variant that allows them to be very resistant to disease. And we can now start to mimic that with uh, medications. And so again, that's, a, that's another aspect. These companies are holding on to millions of individuals uh, DNA and with that, they can do a lot of good in helping direct uh, drug discovery efforts. And you've also seen, at least in 23andMe's case, you've seen them move in that, in that direction. Absolutely. Well, this will be our last question, Dr. Ashley, uh, given the time. And that's really amazing how much is known about genomic sequencing, but what don't we know yet about genomic sequencing? Are there any other genome mysteries that need to be cracked for you and scientists and medical experts to uh, continue understanding its use in disease treatment and uh, uh, prevention? Well, yeah, our job is, is not done, as you might imagine. Uh, a professor would, would rarely believe that we were there. In fact, as every year goes by, I think we have a deeper understanding of just exactly what it is we don't know. And that's important. You know, I think in some ways, the less you know, the more you think you know, and the deeper you get into this, the more you understand that you have to learn. And so we are excited to, to really work with some of the most amazing companies and uh, academics developing new technologies. I mean, the, the draft sequence of the genome that I talked about in the talk, that was 2001 during Bill Clinton's presidency. We're actually only now getting a draft of the genome that's truly complete. There have been holes actually, small holes, but uh, well, maybe not that small, but important holes that we've just started to fill in uh, in, the, in the recent past. And so I would say, first of all, we're only just approaching a really full understanding of the genome. We're moving to be able to understand the diversity of the, of, of the, of the planet, because we've done way too much sequencing of people who are, are white and, you know, I say, you know, white middle-aged men have, have been in the most commonly represented group in all of the studies across biomedicine and, and especially in genetics, it's so obvious we need to do better. So we need to start studying the whole planet uh, and understanding genomics across the world. And so understanding then populations and we sometimes call this graph genomes. So our reference isn't gonna be one sequence anymore. It's gonna be a graph of, of people that really reflects the diversity of the planet. We've got ways of, of studying genomes with much longer sequencing where we can start to put whole portions of the genome together and see things that we, we didn't before. 
There's epigenetics, where we modify the genome to decide which genes are turned on or off. Actually, our, our biology modifies the genome. Yeah, and so we can understand that with some new sequencing approaches. There's plenty more uh, to do, and we're excited to you know to look at, at what we can do with genome sequencing over the next ten years, and how to connect that to technologies like CRISPR gene editing to really start to make an impact on these diseases. Well, Dr. Ashley, thank you so much for your remarkable presentation and for taking the time to so deeply answer each one of our guests' questions with such level of detail. We really appreciate it. And thank you to our guests who joined us today for Dr. Ashley's talk here at Health Matters. Uh, please know that you can get more information about Dr. Ashley's book at genomebook.info and that 100 people from amongst our guests today at this uh, Q&A session will be selected uh, to uh, receive a free copy of Dr. Ashley's book, The Genome Odyssey. And our Health Matters team will be reaching out to those who are selected directly to get those books to you. Also, please know that in the chat section of um, our uh, Zoom window here, there's also more information about the Undiagnosed Disease Network that's available uh, with a hyperlink. Thank you again for joining us and be well today.